Okay, so with all that said, I would like to give uh, the floor to Peter Arsaro. I just need to make him presenter. And then his slide will appear. And Peter, do I need to unmute you? Uh, you are unmuted, so welcome and uh, you can uh, begin. was uh, a robot that was um, designed to utilize material uh, for energy. Uh, so Peter was a DARPA project. Um, next slide, uh, if you will. Um, and actually the company that manufactured it and got the contract wound up having to issue a press release uh, that the robot actually was not a flesh eating robot. Um, it was designed to be strictly vegetarian uh, but it was about getting an extended fuel supply and an energy supply. Um, but if we can go to the next slide. Um, so I think I think that highlights um, some of the major issues, which is really the, the ultimately the disconnect between the public perception over what AI and robotics is capable of and what AI and robotics are actually capable of. And I think in the short term, the problem is primarily that humans tend to overestimate uh, what robots can do and what AI can do. Uh, and this, this involves projecting a lot of uh, human psychology and cognitive skills and abilities onto these systems that they actually don't have. Uh, and that can also lead to over-reliance or over-trusting of the results of, say, an uh, AI uh, process or uh, the suggestions, automated suggestions and the systems. Um, and, and just a sort of belief that robots are capable of doing a lot of things that they're not capable of. And that, that has policy and, and ethical implications. And in the long term, I think the kind of the reverse is true, that we tend to underestimate uh, just how well some of these advanced techniques can work or, or will work in the future. Uh, and we often overestimate human capabilities and how easily or how difficult it will be to replace those capabilities. So, in fact, uh, you know, we, we look at, especially how we look at labor. So if we look at highly skilled labor, like lawyers and doctors in particular, uh, we tend to think of those as being much harder to replace than, uh, say, custodians and janitors or uh, other kinds of low paid, uh, low skill work. Uh, when in reality, uh, some of the things that lawyers and doctors do are actually much more easily, much more easily replaced by automation and robots uh, than some of the things that uh, restaurant waiters and custodians do. Um, so I think we have uh, some work to do in terms of educating the public as to you know, how these systems work, what they're actually capable of. And I think also we have a lot of challenge in, in imagining and forecasting in the future of what sorts of things are going to get automated, what kind of jobs are going to be displaced uh, in the labor market, and, and what are the implications going to be for society as those kinds of transformations happen. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm just going to go over uh, each of these different areas. Uh, one by one, of some of the kind of major social problems and the application. So I'll go over some privacy and surveillance issues, safety, uh, human rights issues, uh, the automation of care work and, and certain socialization practices, uh, technological unemployment and automation. Uh, and then I kind of close with some pointers uh, to some of the issues for brain and behavioral sciences in particular, where those intersect with these issues in intelligent machines and robotics. Okay, so next slide. And I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. Not much time to cover a lot of ground, but I think one of the big issues, and I've written some papers on this, is the transformation of 
of public space in terms of privacy and surveillance. Uh, basically what we're looking at and, and how I understand robotics are systems that are, are mobile, uh, actuated platforms uh, so they can move, they can interact in the physical world, uh, but they, they have sensors, uh, they have some kind of intelligent processing, and they have some kind of actuator. Uh, these systems are going to be increasingly ubiquitous, which we've already seen to some extent with closed circuit television and now with cell phones and mobile platforms in terms of their ability to take photographs or track us and things like that. Uh, but those are systems that are mostly closed systems, at least with CCTV. Um, the cell phones are much more invasive of our private space, but you opt into that. So you decide to purchase a cell phone, and you have some rights over which applications have access to your private data, although there's clearly issues about you know, whether you to grant access to all kinds of private data to these simple apps apps that don't really do much in, in, in return for that. Um, but what we've seen already with the small UAVs, these little drones with cameras, they're mobile, they're very inexpensive, which means they drive down the cost of aerial, aerial surveillance in this case. Um, but they're capable of real-time communications. So we have things like small drones. We also are seeing more of these like license plate cameras. Uh, so these are automated camera systems that can photograph license plates and then do the optical character recognition and essentially track whenever a vehicle passes a certain point. Uh, and there's questions uh, in a number of lawsuits in the U.S. about the ability to aggregate this data by private companies and essentially track people's whereabouts and movements in, in public space through these systems. Uh, and there's also been a lot of discussion around this in the Internet of Things. So as more and more devices are integrated into the Internet, uh, more and more sensors will be collecting data at geographically locatable positions uh, with all sorts of personally identifying kinds of information and data that when you apply, uh, what I have there at the bottom, data, data aggregation and data mining to these, you can actually start to track people's movements, you can understand their daily behaviors, where they're going to work or meetings and where they reside and other sorts of things, um, which is a whole lot of actual private information that's revealable through these public movements. And they're somewhat unavoidable because of their ubiquity, uh, and nobody really opts into them. Uh, there's no opt-out option, so it raises serious issues. Uh, we've also seen more and more advanced sensors, so beyond just cameras, uh, we have LIDAR, which is a laser scanning technique, microwave and penetrating radars, and these are like the backscatter scanners that are being used uh, for airport security now that see through clothing. Uh, there's portable versions of this that are being tested by different police departments. Uh, so it's essentially x-ray vision. Um, <clears throat> and that technology could be potentially miniaturized and made uh, publicly available. There's all sorts of other advanced optic and acoustic kinds of uh, techniques that are becoming available, which, uh, and along with bio and chemical sensors, means all kinds of information about you could suddenly become detectable uh, without touching you or taking your blood sample or anything like that. You can measure pulse now with sensitive cameras that can actually see the blood flow uh, in, in your capillaries. Uh, acoustics, um, lasers that can touch a window and tell you what people are saying inside of a room. Um, and these sorts of things are becoming more and more common. Um, and that raises a whole host of, of issues as these become inexpensive and mounted on robots and other kinds of devices. Um, and robots can sort of go out into public and interact with you. So if you know, people ask you to sign up for uh, petitions or uh, sign up for a credit card or a cell phone out on the street, you could imagine robots doing this. And then there's questions about whether they're able to deceive you, uh, to use advanced interrogation techniques to get you to reveal uh, private or personal information, uh, or even manipulate your behavior and lie to you and things like that. And fundamentally, a question about who has access to that data. And that's in public space with robots that you, you know, haven't 
purchased, you don't own, you don't have any specific contract with the manufacturer or anything like that as you typically do with software today. Um, but even in cases where you purchase a robot and say you use it in your home, uh, these private robots are going to have access to all kinds of personal information, uh, your behavior and lifestyle, and how you navigate your uh, domestic sphere. Um, and there's a question of who can access that data? Can these robots encourage you to purchase certain products and, and things like that? Do they have to reveal who they're working for or who they're giving information to? Uh, and questions like that. Next slide. Um, so the other issue that gets talked about a lot in the other big application area is, of course, safety and the particular application uh, of self-driving cars. So autonomous cars are in operation. They're being tested. Um, they're not quite ready. Uh, there's a number of issues about getting them to operate. Um, their laser radar systems don't work well in the rain or the snow. Um, we also don't know really what happens with those systems. Uh, because they shoot out a laser that bounces back. If you have a road full of these systems, they tend to interfere with one another. And so that's going to be an issue. And then the roads that they travel have to be well mapped. Um, so there's a whole um, But these are very dangerous. They're large objects. They can run people over and kill people. And they probably will. Uh, so how do we regulate those? to ensure that we minimize that risk. Um, people run each other over and kill each other in automobiles uh, at fairly high numbers already. So if we can reduce those numbers, then the technology will, could be very valuable. Um, but the question is, how do you ensure their safety? Uh, drones are another issue. The small ones are fairly innocuous, although they can hurt you if they crash into you. Uh, Amazon is discussing you know, doing package deliveries to individual houses by, with individual packages. But if that were to happen, you're talking about you know, thousands of these things flying around, which means that even very low failure rates, these things are going to fall out of the sky occasionally and crash into things. Um, of course, there's also in that sense, issues of environmental pollution, noise pollution. Uh, these, you know, if you think of all the packages that would get delivered in New York City in a day, that's a lot of drones flying around. Um, so it's going to transform the public airspace pretty dramatically. Um, but also even simple personal robots and appliances will have all kinds of safety considerations uh, with vacuum cleaning and lawn mowing. And anything that's large enough to move around physical objects is also large enough to hurt people. So really thinking about liability in these cases. So if systems become increasingly autonomous, are manufacturers liable or the users liable? Um, who, who pays for damages when things go wrong? And how do we regulate these systems to ensure uh, that the proper people are compensated? And also to ensure there's reliability and testing and standards in place for what could be very complicated environments and very complicated kinds of applications and domains. The next slide. Um, the area I've been working in primarily for the past few years is looking at autonomous weapons and, and the implications for human rights if we allow these autonomous robotic systems and autonomous weapons to kill people uh, independently of human control and supervision. Uh, and what does that mean exactly? Um, so within the context of international law and the work we've been doing at the United Nations on uh, the campaign to stop killer robots, uh, we've defined autonomous weapons as any system that can autonomously target and fire a weapon. Uh, and this raises a whole host of issues and questions. I think first and foremost is a question of human rights and human dignity and whether it's um, appropriate to delegate authority to kill people to automated systems. Uh, the law is quite clear in internet. National laws have a responsibility to protect civilian populations and ensure that in every attack uh, it's a warranted attack, that it's discriminate, that it's proportional, and that it, there's a military necessity behind it. And I think that it entails a certain level of human cognitive capacity that automated systems 
simply don't have at this time. They're not moral agents. And more importantly, they're not legal agents, uh, which means they can't be held legally liable or responsible if, if they kill civilians or make mistakes. Um, they become, those are just technical errors. Uh, there's nobody who's morally or, or legally culpable um, for those kinds of mistakes. And then there's you know safety and performance issues. So are these systems going to jeopardize the lives of civilians and civilian infrastructures? Uh, if they do, who's responsible? Uh, and then in a more traditional arms sense, they, they could contribute to regional and global insecurity, arms races. Uh, they could proliferate to non-state actors and terrorists. Uh, it's not like nuclear technology. It's quite simple to build these kinds of autonomous systems. And it's very difficult to build very sophisticated and reliable ones, however. Um, and what we've already seen, uh, so with uh, competitive algorithms in stock trading, are the fact that they're, they're intrinsically unpredictable systems because you have competitors who are not sharing their code and you have so multiple algorithms in a, that are competing against each other without knowing how the other actors in the competition are going to behave. So mathematically, that's an unpredictable system. Uh, and what we see are certain positive feedback loops that emerge, uh, the flash crashes, at the stock market, so there was a big one in 2010, a bunch of algorithms sold off something like a quarter or a third of the value of the New York Stock Exchange in a couple of hours, and they had to shut down all of the, the full system and, and roll back a bunch of the trades and restart everything. Um, we even had some additional flash crashes this summer, um, and these could be triggered by different things. So if we think what happens in a military conflict when Systems are automatically engaging each other, uh, escalating situations automatically, or you know, retaliating uh, to attacks automatically. You could very easily see situations where the speed at which a situation develops and escalates you know, exceeds the ability of humans to intervene uh, or to actually make the kind of political or military decisions to control a situation. Uh, and once you hook up weapons to this kind of automatic control system, then everything is subject to the weakest link of your cybersecurity. So these systems could be hacked and spoofed and taken control of by third parties uh, and used to uh, attack other parties and so forth. So uh, there's a whole host of, of issues that come up when you start thinking about weaponizing robotic systems and intelligent systems. Uh, then there's also questions of, you know, those are all sort of international relations, military questions. But what happens when these systems are used domestically for policing? Uh, can can they use force, uh, whether that's lethal force or, or less lethal tasers and tear gas, which we've already seen some drones, small drones uh, armed in this way for policing and riot control. Um, but I think there's a broader range of issues about automatic system denying human rights to people, um, is that due process, is there a right to due process that entails that human judgment uh, is, is necessary. And uh, evictions and foreclosures, I think, is a broad area. Um, there's, there's a number of lawsuits in the U.S. revolving around robo-signing of foreclosure notices following the most recent economic collapse. Uh, where banks were not doing um, their due diligence on reviewing uh, foreclosure notices and were just having computers automatically issue for foreclosures uh, by the thousands. Uh, similarly, systems that are automatically eliminating people from voting rolls or, or denying them credit or other kinds of economic rights. So anything that kind of falls under basic human, political, and economic, religious rights, or the UN Declaration on Human Rights, and if you have an automated system that's automatically denying people those rights, what are, what are there's, what is their recourse to due process and to having actual human judgment as to the legitimacy of um, their being denied those rights? Next slide. Okay. Um, so there's a whole host of questions uh, that arise when you start automating care work and other forms of work that entail socialized uh, interaction. Um, there's a lot of development in the area of elder care and health care robots and potentially of mental health care. Uh, and for the most part, these can greatly enhance 
uh, the ability of, of people to improve their quality of life, enhance the ability of healthcare workers to do certain difficult jobs like lifting patients out of their beds who are bedridden in order to do cleaning and then clean changing the sheets and eliminate bed sores, um, which also results in a lot of back injuries among healthcare workers. Um, and also extending the dignity of, of the elderly people. Uh, but of course, there's different ways to do that. And if we're talking about you know, warehousing the elderly and having them attended to by robots and reducing their amount of social interaction, then that's probably a bad model of how to proceed. And a better model is looking at how these systems could enhance the ability of the elderly to stay in their own homes for longer uh, and improve their quality of life uh, as they become older. Uh, and improve their freedom of mobility and things like that. Um, but there's serious questions about the ethics of care and caregiving. Um, in the you know the kind of hyperbolic literature that promotes these systems, care uh, is often framed as a, merely a service providing, and it, you can easily substitute the human service provider with a machine to provide the same service. Uh, but there's a lot more that goes on in care. Care is a is one of those forms of labor that's often not given uh, as much value in society as it, it's worthy of. Uh, it's often hidden work uh, and things like that that go into it. Um, and there's also a reciprocal aspect of, of the ethic of care and caregiving in which people who give care actually sort of enjoy that and and are rewarded emotionally from the kind of support that they give to people. And so you're denying people the ability to give care is, is another question uh, itself. So I think we have to be very careful about how we think about that and uh, how we develop those kinds of systems to be sensitive. Hi, Peter. Sorry to interrupt you. This is uh, me again. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up in the next couple of minutes, if that's okay with you. Just, uh, I know you have a couple of slides left. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah. you could just pick out a couple of points that you want to make, and and uh, and if you're very uh, friendly to us, then you can uh, just repeat uh, your main points, and then we can uh, move on to the commentator. Is that okay with you? That'd be fine. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So I think something similar uh, occurs in childcare, although in childcare you have another issue, which is that. The social interaction that children have is actually teaching them how to be social people. Uh, and I think it's much more difficult to think how we're going to develop automated systems or robots that are going to teach children how to be people. Uh, and I think there's a certain element to which you need humans as educators and, and caregivers of children. Um, and again, figuring out how to use these things as tools. I'll skip over uh, the sex bots, but there's, of course, a lot of discussion about what might be appropriate or inappropriate uh, as far as people having sex with machines uh, and or fulfilling various fantasies. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Hello? Uh, we put on the next slide. I don't know if you don't see it. Okay, yeah, it was slow, I guess. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, so, already talked a little bit about automation and technological unemployment. Uh, taken to its extreme, where basically everybody gets replaced by robots. Uh, there's questions of whether that kind of economy is sustainable, whether that would require basic income, and things like that. I think in the near term, what we're going to see is, you know, basically things like drivers uh, of cars and trucks, taxi drivers, truck drivers are all going to become unemployed in the next five or six years, and that's going to be a major uh, social upheaval. Uh, next slide. And I'll just end with some questions. So that was sort of a big picture of robotics. Uh, I think when you start getting into human-computer interaction and actually applying behavioral sciences, uh, there's a lot of questions about the use of, say, eye tracking, uh, face recognition, biometrics, um, and robot interrogation and manipulation, where uh, using these kinds of advanced techniques, these systems are going to be able to elicit a lot of information about people and their beliefs and their psychology uh, that aren't necessarily apparent to other people uh, normally. 
And so I think there was certainly a kind of question about privacy there and how advanced can these systems be and eye tracking in particular about figuring out people's focus of interest. And then there's a whole set of interests uh, which are probably the people in the audience know more about than I do around brain machine interfaces. Um, so questions about bodily integrity and neuroprosthetics. So these systems are attached to you. Do, do they have the same rights? Um, do you have a right to control your prosthetics or your neuroprosthetics in the same way as other parts of your body? And questions about security and hacking. So right now you can't really hack into somebody's brain, but if you have brain machine interfaces, does that make it possible to suddenly start hacking into people's brain with thoughts and memories and things like that? Um, and I think these are all kind of long-term open questions. I don't hear you uh, anymore, Peter. Was that the end? Yeah, you dropped out. Yeah. Um, so I think with that, I, um, I'm ready for questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm now going to give uh, the floor to Anna Lures, who's going to comment uh, on your presentation. I just have to find her in the list. Okay. People.